Good morning. I'm Bruce Taylor. I'm Executive Vice President for Data Center Dynamics with a responsibility primarily for North America and for some of our strategic direction. This is our 10th year in Toronto. Uh, each year this conference has evolved, grown, improved. And I want to say something about the audience, all of you. Um, the global economy runs because of what you do. Nothing happens in the global economy today without the data center and the people who design, build, and operate that critical infrastructure. So this is in celebration of you. It's also a warning that what we know about the data center is rapidly evolving. We are in the era of digital transformation, Industry 4.0, and yet we haven't yet begun to grapple with what that's going to mean. So that's what today is about. That's what this opening, this very special plenary keynote is about. You are the people who make this happen. The people who are going to be on this stage in a couple of minutes are the captains of the technology that you deploy in your data centers to run the Canadian economy, and particularly the Canadian economy 4.0. So a, a couple of quick things. This event marks the first time. Uh, actually, we're, we've jumped it by just a little bit. We have a new relationship uh, globally with Uptime Institute as a strategic partner on content and knowledge sharing. Keith Klesner, who is senior most engineer for uh, Uptime Institute, joins us today. Uh, and you'll hear a bit about what he has to say uh, this afternoon. We have two plenary roundtables. This one that really looks at things from the 50,000 foot view as it relates to the Canadian economy and its ability to compete uh, in the global era of digital transformation. Huawei publishes an annual report called the Index of Connectivity, or some, some such thing. Canada slipped in the rankings, which is what got me to the idea of Connected Canada 4.0. Uh, it slipped in the rankings from, I believe it was uh, 12th to 14th among the modern economies of the world in the calendar year 2016. I'm not trying to champion Huawei, but this particular index is very carefully, it's a set of metrics that are very carefully thought through. It's everything from workforce readiness to 3G and 4G pickup, not even talking about 5G yet. And Canada slipped and two other economies, one in Europe and one in Asia PAC, uh, exceeded it. Now that isn't particularly meaningful uh, if you're comparing apples and oranges. Singapore is a very different uh, connectivity market than is Canada. But the index, in theory, covers that, accounts for that within the metrics of it. So I ask you to look at that report and see what you glean from it, because it tells a very interesting story, both hopeful uh, and also one that I would think, if I were uh, within the government of Canada, I'd be actually quite concerned about. Because this is your competitive position in the world market. So globally, the number of hyperscale cloud data centers will double by 2020, counting from the end of 2015. That's half of the stock of the world's data centers. Hyperscale cloud already accounts for 35% of total data traffic within data centers and will grow to 53% by 2020. 
total internet traffic passing through data centers was about five zettabytes in 2015. In 2010, we didn't know the word, and it will triple to over 15 zettabytes by 2020. We called our London conference in November Zetastructure, the digital infrastructure required to manage the digital transformation era. By 2020, over 92% of all compute workloads in the world will be in the cloud and cloud data centers. 8% will be in traditional on-prem data centers. We stand today in digital transformation and in IoT at 8.4 billion connected devices worldwide, more than the population of the Earth. That will grow to over 50 billion data producing, data consuming devices at the network edge over the next three years. The network edge is the fastest growing part. If we think the, the cloud data center is the fastest growing at the enterprise level, um, the network edge is actually the fastest growing segment. This is because the IoT demands that compute processing be as close to the origination and the consumption of data as possible, as automated as possible. These, this new class of data centers doesn't look like what we've seen before. It may come in a very high capacity half rack and full rack, and sometimes even smaller. It's like going back to the era of the server closet, if you will, except it will look much different, it will behave much different, it will consume a whole new level of power, and it will be able to do things that data centers 20 times its size couldn't do two years ago. So think about that and what it means for your business. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Michael O'Neill, who is co-chair of this conference. He's principal analyst for Insight as a Service. Uh, he is the spark plug behind the Toronto Cloud Business Coalition. Uh, longtime industry analyst, good friend of DCDs, has worked with us in producing this conference. Is this the fourth year or third year? It's a bunch of years. <laughs> uh, and it's a delight to have him with us. Um, we thank you for putting up with us. It's important. He's going to moderate this first round table that I'm very excited about. And then we bracket the end of the day with another round table where we're talking with uh, professionals at the edge, professionals who are actually practitioners of digital transformation in AI, in AR and VR, in autonomous vehicles and robotics, and a host of other applications that only occur at the edge. I'm going to leave you with one last thought. Jim Fletcher, who just retired as IBM's um, director of the IoT, IBM Watson's director of their IoT platform, retired in November, spoke at our conference in London. He and I did a webinar together. Gartner says that 90% of all data today collected in core data centers is wasted, wasted data. So I asked Jim Fletcher what he thought of that and he said, oh, really? It's more like 99% of all data is wasted. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place. It means that we haven't yet learned how to manage big data. 
We haven't learned how to use the analytical tools to make it useful and make it important. The edge is going to cause an explosion of data beyond what there is now. In conversations with a very large company uh, less than five days ago, they said they couldn't use the data that they collected. This is a global enterprise of a brand name you all know. They said, because we haven't learned how to clean, we haven't learned how to organize, and we haven't learned how to use the data. Now, the very second that we do learn that, the very second we learn that, is going to cause another explosion in growth. And that's the thought I'd like to leave you on. Michael, please take it. Kick me off. Uh, if you haven't grabbed your magazine, please do so. This proves that print is still alive. <laughs> Peter Judge, who's the global editor for DCD, is right here. Go up and ask him about that. Why? Thanks, folks. It's great to be here. I'm. I am. I've been excited about this day for a really long time, and um, and not uh, and mostly because of this panel. This I've never seen a panel quite like the one that's depicted on the slides behind us. Um, and what we're going to do is, as a roundtable is I'm going to call folks up one at a time and, you know, just so you guys can prep, kind of in the order that you see your pictures on there, except I said to Kevin I'd leave him till later. Um, and what we're going to do is ask each of the folks who are, represent the, the best collection of leaders in this industry that, that we've ever had together uh, in one place, anywhere in Canada in the 30 years that I've been working uh, in this capacity, um, and ask them each to present over three or four minutes kind of a, a personal vision of what digital transformation means in a Canadian context. Then we're going to, as, as they come up, we're going to ask you to grab a seat, any seat that you want, and then we'll run through a series of questions to, uh, except we'll save one for you right in the middle there, Kevin. Um, we'll <laughs> uh, we will, um, work through a series of questions that, that uh, we've kind of pre-established with these folks. And then, you know, as you folks have questions for the panelists, uh, please jot them down or keep them in mind. We'll reserve time at the end of the session uh, for that, um, for questions uh, from the floor. Um, Ash, can we start with you? Um, Ash Mather is the um, uh, Managing Director for Canada for CenturyLink. And Ash, if you can get us started, that would be terrific. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so what does digital transformation mean to me? I think digital transformation means different things to different people. As I look at my experience and I look at the literature out there and working with customers, I think there's different ways to look at this. First of all, digital and digital transformation is a buzzword. But it starts with the basics. It starts with turning manual processes into automated processes. It starts with self-service. Starts with doing the fundamentals, being on the latest levels of technology to take advantage of feature and functionality. Then the middle tier is really optimization, using cloud, using virtualization, and using other technologies to optimize a business. But that's not digital transformation. Digital transformation is truly disrupting the business, disrupting your own business, and potentially disrupting the industry. That's what digital transformation is all about. And there are companies out there that are doing that. There are industries that are being disrupted. I would, I would submit that almost every industry out there is being disrupted. And the question really is, for an enterprise, do you want to be a disruptor or be disrupted? So that's what digital transformation means to me. And I look forward to talking to you some more about that this morning. Thank you, Ash. Um, uh, next, Denis uh, Goudreau, uh, Country Manager for Intel Canada. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Denis. Thank you. So uh, I think we all feel, so everybody in the room here, feel and, and see the impact of the digital transformation in our professional life or personal life. So we all know the impact. When there's a big impact, big change, there's a big opportunity and, and, and big challenge in front of us. 
So, and I think the, what, mean for, what that means for Canada, if we look at the uh, big opportunity, big uh, challenge in front of us, so we need to understand what's going on, right? Where those opportunities come from, where those challenges come from. And if I draw a line to you that show the, I would say, the scientific and technology progress over time. So for many, many centuries, right, the line was pretty straight and was just growing very slowly. Your life in the third century to the eighth century was pretty much the same. So, and you look at the uh, industrial revolution, so like a couple of hundred years ago, when that starts, so the line start to really show more an exponential curve. So, and things start to build on, every technology start to build on the shoulder of others, and things go to very fast, and there's a way that the knowledge can scale globally very fast, like just take the car, the plane, so it took a couple of years, and it was all over the place, right? 25, 30 years. So, but when we look at us, our own adaptability to technology and scientific progress as a person, as a society, where we put all the safeguard in place, so to protect and all the law legislations, and we understand how the technology work, and we can make it work in our society. So that line is very linear, right? So there's a big gap where we are today in technology progress and how much we can adapt as a society. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that gap, that's where the opportunity is for the all of us, for Canada, but also it can be a challenge. I think what that means yes. for Canada is a huge opportunity. The way I see it is like, I would say it should be a dynamic stability. So it's like riding a bike, right? So when you ride a bike and as long as you move, things are perfect, you can avoid any obstacle and stuff like that. But as soon as you stop to move, you fall. So I guess for us as a country to be able to take advantage of that opportunity, we need to have that dynamic stability and to adapt with all the change and find a ways in our governance and our learnings, whether it's in our infrastructures or building your human capital and everything, that we can close that gap and learn faster. So that's how I see it. So thank you. Thank you, Denis. Um, next, Jim Lim, country manager for Google Cloud. Thank you, Jim. Hi, thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, I think I too don't necessarily like the phrase uh, digital transformation because I think it's highly overused and, and often ill-defined. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that we're in the middle of something that's pretty interesting and it's pretty phenomenal. Um, I mean, Bruce, your comments and your remarks and those statistics are pretty daunting, actually, depending on what side of the scale you want to you wanna look. <laughs> I look at, um, you know, I, I gave a presentation the other day and I, this kind of marks my 29th year in this industry. And so I've witnessed client server, you know, my, my first career was with VMS as an operating system, you know, which, which isn't around anymore. I remember the promise of the portable SQL databases of Ingress and Sybase and, and Oracle at the time. Um, you know, we've, set, we've seen PCs uh, really flatline, now they're declining. The way your constituents want to talk to you as a company is now mobile. Not just your customers anymore, your constituents now, the way your employees want to talk to you and deal with you is through mobile devices. So all of that's changed. I think IT leadership, now since Taidomi has retired, I honestly <laughs> believe IT, IT leadership has the toughest job in the country. <laughs> I really believe that. Because now we're in the middle of something else. We're in the middle of this phenomena that we want to call either digital transformation or hyperscale growth or cloud computing. We're in the middle of that right now. But I also think it represents possibly the single largest opportunity for Canada. Because I believe cloud computing and this digital transformation that we're in the middle of right now is a great equalizer. So um, you know, we, we had a pretty significant event here in Toronto a few weeks ago. And you know, part of my keynote was it really al allows any city in Canada to compete with any other city in the world. And Google, we're looking to try to facilitate that. We want to arm those cities. I think it's important for Canada and our government in Canada to take advantage of the situation and the opportunity that we're in right now. So I look forward to digital transformation, although I hate the word, but I love the opportunity. Thank you. I'll spread it out. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let's, let's jump on down to the bottom line and, and ask uh, Mark Briard, who instructed me as an Anglo to pronounce, uh, pronounce his name that way, um, uh, Chief Technology Officer for the Government of Canada to give us an, uh, 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 an end user perspective on this. Mark? 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we have a few users. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so being from government, I approach digital transformation from the citizens' perspective uh, and from the needs of the public servants that ultimately deliver services to Canadians. Um, and as it's very public these days, we have a long way to go. Uh, you'll have undoubtedly heard about our payroll systems where we're having problems paying our employees. Uh, we can't roll out a common email platform. Uh, we can't get all government web content on the same platform. So these are, these are real challenges. But none of these issues are technology problems. It's not like hundreds and thousands of organizations aren't using exactly the same technology as we are, and they're doing it successfully. Uh, it's not that email doesn't work or, or payroll systems don't work. It's the integrations. In fact, there's no such thing as a technology problem. Don't get me wrong, there are lots of technology issues. It's why we all have jobs. Uh, but they aren't the real problems. We mustn't forget that the problems we're trying to solve are business problems. They're problems that meet the needs in, uh, of the organizations. So as we start looking at digital transformation, uh, we must not forget that it's about solving those real world problems. Problems like getting a passport more quickly or about being able to ch change your address once and having all the systems that need to know about mm -hmm. that be notified. Fric frictionless end-to-end -end processes. These are the digital experiences that Canadians expect. And we're being measured against companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, Netflix, and they're setting a very high bar. Everyone has a phone. Everyone has experiences, Christmas shopping online. Those are the things we're being measured against, and we are not meeting expectations. We must focus less on the technology and more on the people and the processes. We have to do, develop new muscles that, are, that challenge inefficient processes, and we must always be on the lookout for the worst enemy of all, the status quo. So these are hard challenges. They require us to work across silos and integrate systems that don't normally talk to each other. This is where you come in. This is where technology can really provide benefits. Uh, we must be an active participant in digital innovation as the federal government, not just by being consumers, but also by working with organizations like yours to discover what real business problems we're trying to solve, communicate them effe efficiently, and develop solutions that meet our requirements. So in other words, it's a partnership. We can't do it in silos. We can't do it alone. And if we think we know the answers to our problems, we see what happens. So my vision for a digital Canada includes a Canadian digital government that provides services that are as efficient as possible and that meets the expectation of Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, those of you with uh, good eyes have probably noticed that we have two folks on the agenda from, uh, from Equinix. Um, we weren't certain that Andrew would make it back from Boston in time, and he walked in just as we were ready to come up. So we have, we have two folks prepped, and, and Sanj, uh, maybe we can start with you. Sanj is the, uh, the uh, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Equinix in Canada, and, and I know you've prepared some remarks for this, so if, if you could come on up and help us with those, those that would be great. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, so, as Michael said, my name is Sanj. I'm uh, the chief technologist, actually, not officer, but chief technologist chief for Canada. Fancy way of saying I have a focus from a technology perspective of all of Canada, which is very unique, right? Um, digital experience, uh, sorry, digital transformation. What is it to Canada? In my opinion, digital transformation is where we as Canadians draw on our strengths of creativity, collaboration, and inventiveness to show the world a better way to do things, right? But there is a pitfall. We need to be very careful. For too long, people have been focused on data sovereignty as a crutch to stifle Canadian innovation. We need to start showing the world a, a future where Canadians are on the forefront. In order to do this at Equinix, we've been preaching for a long time our vision of what we call IOA, or what uh, Gardner has been referring to as the digital edge. And what that effectively means is moving your content closer to your eyeballs. Improve user experience. Um, improve user experience and make it easier to do business internationally. 
Uh, ultimately, we need to be able to leverage IOA Digital Edge in order to let Canadians deliver and show the world our strengths right, on a global scale. So, thank you. Thank you, Sanj. Um, Terry, uh, Terry uh, Stewart is the uh, Chief Innovation Officer for Deloitte Canada. Terry, could you come up and uh, share, uh, share a perspective for us? Sure. Thank Thanks. You. Um, and I applaud Bruce and the DCD team for creating this kind of forum for Canadians to talk about some of the issues. Um, I have a great job at Deloitte, so Chief Innovation Officer. That and about five bucks get you a coffee at Starbucks, though. Um, so what do I have to do? So my job is to take a 150-year-old company in Canada with 10,000 people, and how do we transform to take advantage of new technologies, new capabilities to serve our clients? Part two of my job is actually helping our clients <clears throat> transform themselves with innovation to build sustainable innovation in their, in their um, organizations. <clears throat> and then the third leg that I actually enjoy the most of all of it is I help drive our Future of Canada research so how do we change the agenda for Canada? Seven years ago, 2010, as we were all going through that little thing called the global financial crisis, Kevin Lynch, who was deputy clerk of the Privy Council in Canada, one of the best thinkers on productivity and innovation in the country, came to our partner meeting. And he said one sentence that changed how we thought about the country. He said, we are at the first time ever in the history of Canada where if we don't change the productivity and innovation agenda, the next generation will have a worse quality of life than we do. Let me just say that again. We're at the first time ever in the history of our country where if we, we, those of us that drive programs in, in, our, uh, in our companies, don't change the productivity and innovation agenda, we're gonna have a worse quality of life for our kids than we do. I have a 23-year-old and a 19-year-old. I made the mistake of telling them that story, and they now <laughs> remind me daily, so dad, what are you doing? What are you doing to change the productivity and innovation agenda? Um, so we created something called the Future of Canada program. Every year we do quantitative research on what are the root causes of innovation and, and the challenges that we have. What are some of the myths? So we've tackled um, exporting. Only 3.6% of our companies actually export. Ridiculous. The ones that do live 16 years longer than the ones that don't. So why isn't everybody getting into it? Uh, we looked at investments in technology, and we think that we're very good at investing in technology and supporting our group. Actually, Canadian organizations invest 35% per capita less than our U.S. and global colleagues. Surprise, surprise, we're not as productive. And whether that's in the machine, machine floor or in the data centers, it's true across the board. So we have to actually start getting underneath that. Uh, two years ago, we did something, we poked on the age of disruption. So um, Denis talked about the revolutions that we've had. The World Economic Forum would call the era that we're living in the fourth industrial revolution. So we've had the computing revolution, et cetera, but now it's the fourth industrial revolution. So we looked at technologies, AI, IoT, robotics, 3D printing, crowdsourcing, and um, and looked at that whole space and said, how aware and prepared are Canadian organizations? We looked at over 1,000 companies, and only 13% of the companies self-reported, 13% said they knew about the technology, they had a strategy for the technology, and they were investing in it. 13%. Now, those of you in the room are probably all in that 13%. That's the good news. The bad news is 35% of the organization said, no clue. Don't know about it, don't think it's relevant, not worried about it, not investing in it. So the people that you are trying to sell your services to or to partner with actually aren't really getting it. So that's why we created our speaker series where we're trying to educate the country on the fact that AI will change everyone's industry. IoT is going to be something, and Bruce, I think, created a great compelling story at the front end of the stats in terms of how fast this is going, but we have to wake up the country or we're gonna fall behind. So I, have, I am a, um, a fatalistic optimist in this world. I actually always see the positives in this. I think there's an amazing opportunity. The data would suggest that we have to change our trajectory. We have the good fortune of working, I sit on our global innovation executive, so we, I get to see projects that we're doing around the world. And Singapore was mentioned earlier around, they're moving up in the ranks. We're working with the Export Development Corporation in Singapore, helping to think about how to train the entire country 
on artificial intelligence and blockchain, helping think about how to train the entire country on artificial intelligence and blockchain. Canada is a leader in AI, as seen by the Vector Institute and the things that Ed Clark and Premier Wynn are trying to do. We have the opportunity to go ahead and seize that, um, but we need to actually be bold. And if, you, if you're interested in some of the future Canada research, you can go online and take a look at it. Our latest report is Canada at 175. So what is our vision for the country another 25 years out, and how do we actually change our trajectory? Thank you. That was great. One of the truly frightening things about those 35% uh, numbers is that it isn't the case that only 65% of Canadians have these versus 100% of Americans. The underinvestment is much deeper in the stack, which is the kind of technology that we're talking about here today. Um, Lloyd Switzer is the SVP responsible for network transformation at TELUS. Lloyd, can you explain to us what's happening deeper in the stack? Sure. Thank you. I guess I'm going to take a bit more of an optimistic view and some, uh, I'll, I'll start from connect as a service provider from connectivity forward because we enable so much of what happens around this digital transformation. Um, Canada, this is, so I appreciate Bruce, the uh, 2016, 2017, OpenSignal, PCMag, Ookla just measured wireless networks across the globe. The, who, we guess which country has the fastest mobile networks of the GA countries? Canada. So we've actually made a lot of progress. We're twice as fast as the networks in the US, which we're really, all of us in this industry are really proud of. The fact that they're, they're, we're at 30 megabit per second as our, as our average speed of our mobile networks. With the evolution towards 5G, we're moving towards 100 and 1,000 times, times that. Two orders of magnitude, three order magnitudes improvements, which we've already shown in our living labs that we can actually get. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about the path that we're on around connecti improving connectivity. The other part of our digital tra transformation deeper in the stack is that, is that network edge of how do we virtualize and put compute power as close to the end user as we possibly can. So in our world, that means we're going to take things out of our traditional data centers that were centralized, and we are going to push them as deeply as we can into every single neighborhood. One of the benefits we get out of that is incredibly low latency across the network. Another promise of what's happening on 5G. All that is just infrastructure and underwear that we're going to put in place. The real magic happens on digital transformation when you go up to stack to say, how do I take that and actually transform the customer experience to be completely frictionless, to be effortless? How do we go transform processes within our businesses to take advantage of that level of connectivity and low latency in the network? And I think that's the challenge for us as Canadian leaders is to actually go think of how do we transform our processes and the customer experience, the technologies are there and evolving, but we have a responsibility to go change those processes uh, and, and change that customer experience to make it completely effortless. Thank you. Thanks, Lita. I'm not sure I've ever heard underwear as a tech term, but that's <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce our second Equinix uh, uh, guest. Um, uh, Andrew, thank you for flying in from uh, Boston to join us. Um, you are the managing director, country manager for Equinix? For Canada, yeah. For Canada, yeah. yes. And I flew back home to Canada, so I'm born and raised here, uh, run a sales team down in New England as well. Um, first off, I'm humbled by the talent that you guys were able to assemble. Um, if we can't transform uh, Canada with the talent that's on the stage, I think we've got a pretty tough job ahead of us. Uh, so thanks for the, the dialogue today, gentlemen. Um, from our perspective at Equinix, just to kind of embellish a little bit what Sandra was talking about, we see ourselves as an endpoint on a very global scale. So it's not the Cana Canadian wide web, it's the world wide web. Uh, we have 190 centers around the world where Canada is an extension of that fabric. And I think to challenge each other in the room to figure out how we export our best and don't become kind of too conservative and complacent in not allowing the best stuff to come in as well is the vision for transformation that we have. So hopefully a spirited conversation this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Microsoft guy. And we, we, are, are, uh, we have reserved one seat at the center for Kevin Easker, president of Microsoft Canada. Kevin, if you could finish, you. Uh, finish off the introductory Thank round, you. we'd appreciate it. Let's hear it, buddy. <laughs> I, I, this is pretty awesome, isn't it? And uh, Terry, you complete me. <laughs> I've never met you before, but I'm feeling a little bit of friendly Please man love that. here Please with Terry. That. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's okay. I believe in diversity. So, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm the president of Microsoft Canada, and 
Uh, this topic is a fundamental topic for Canada. You know, the dialogues that I get to have as I go across the country are illuminating. I'm fortunate enough to meet with members of the government, higher education, in the small business sector, the medium business sector, and the largest corporations across this country. And I too have a 28 year plus career in this industry. And what is phenomenal is that the dialogues, especially over the last couple of years, have shifted. Recently I was in with the CEO of one of Canada's uh, most influential banks, an organization that has a 150 year plus history. And I heard something that I don't think would have been said by an individual in that position in the past. And it was this dialogue and discussion that, yes, we are actually older than the country of Canada. We provide banking services, but we are in the midst of a fundamental revitalization of our organization to not think of ourselves as a bank, but to think of ourselves as a digital entity providing financial services. This is from the CEO of one of our leading institutions. And if we think about that and relate it to some of the statistics that my colleagues have thrown out and Rob threw out at the front end, you know, executives across this country understand, McKinsey will say it's 80%, understand that digital disruption is here. 84% understand that it's imminent. 50% think that in three years, their businesses will effectively their business models will be totally redundant, yet the action that's occurring is not happening. And it's not happening for a number of reasons. And I've got three platforms. I, I know we only have a couple of minutes for this, but three platforms to me that encapsulate it. One is the supply side. And we think about the supply side in our industry overall. Love to go into that. Number two is the perspective of business itself. And why my friend completes me is, I think as Canadians, we fundamentally, as a country, need to wake up. Great comments from a government perspective. Uh, we're seeing the government now go to the cloud to be able to activate services in a real-time, meaningful way. But this connection between business and the supply side of our industry is absolutely fundamental. Uh, I'll give you one example of, uh, of an individual who kind of inspired me along this version, th this vision, and it's Marc Parent. Marc Parent, very well thought of CEO. He's the CEO of CAE Systems. For those of you who don't know, CAE, based out of Montreal, grew out of the aerospace industry in Montreal. A world, Canadian company, a world leader in providing aircraft simulators to the entire industry, from military through to civilian. A world leader, the best technology on the planet, born right here in Canada, on the bleeding edge. And Mark pulled together his CFO, his chief legal counsel, three of his business uh, division presidents, his head of marketing, his head of PR, his head of HR, and by the way, brought his CTO along to our facility in Redmond to do two days, two days out of the business to understand better in every business aspect this concept of digital disruption. Because he has a sense of urgency, a paranoia about being disrupted. And when we think about that paranoia, I think it comes down to the comment uh, that we should all be considering either we transform or we will be transformed. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Actually, the, being on the uh, tour of the shop floor at, at, uh, at, at CAE is one of, the, one of the best experiences you can have. That, that it looks like it's the, phenomenal, isn't it? It looks like the set of a sci-fi movie there. <laughs> so I have a series of, of questions that, are, that I've prepared and discussed with these folks. If we get through them, great. If we just have a discussion, that's fine, too. I'm not, not all that um, uh, focused on this. And if you folks have questions, we will reserve some time uh, at the end of the session for that. Um, first, I have, the questions are arranged from kind of global to, 
to uh, national, to enterprise, to individual level, and hopefully we will at least tick off those boxes. I'd like to start at the global level and, and ask, um, Mark, maybe we can s start with you. How do you see Canada's ability to fully participate and compete in the global economy being dependent on its digital transformation maturity? And what does that maturity look like to you? Uh, that's a great question. So I think that there are several areas where we uh, are, are very well positioned to be uh, world leaders. And uh, you talked about AI and blockchain, and I, I believe that some of those newer uh, technologies, I think, can, can really help us not just transform, but leap out of the legacy that we're, we're sort of all immersed in into these new fields. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we need to do to make that happen? Um, we need exposure. I think that we need lots of different levels of exposure. We need exposure across industries. We need to be able to understand how things like these new emerging technologies will have an impact on regulation, policies, trade, those types of things. Mm -hmm. But also we need exposure internationally. I think we have to, and someone mentioned that, that tendency to not export. We have to go out and we have to be on the world stage um, and something very un-Canadian, but we have to you know, toot our own horns. We have to advertise. <laughs> So I, I think that that's, that's a big part of how we can uh, move forward in that space. Thanks. Denis, uh, you, I know you were interested in this topic as well. Did you, did you want to amplify that? Yeah, so I think I'll piggyback a bit on Lloyd. So the way I see it is like uh, we have made a lot of progress on the infrastructure point of view, right? So with, whether it's broadband penetration, so affordability and uh, availability and all that stuff. So, But one aspect I think that it's very important for Canada is all the uh, around the development of human capital, right? So mm -hmm. from like all the STEMs programs in schools, to making sure in kindergarten, to like they learn to code, through K-12, to higher ed, so how we develop like higher end talents, how we retain them, how we attract that talent inside mm -hmm. the country. Because whatever the technology we're talking about, blockchain, AI, the autonomous vehicles, it's all about talent that we'll have in the country that can develop and use all. So it won't be, I mean, we know we'll be a shortage of high end talent, so we have to do everything. I think we're in good position for that because Canada, mm -hmm. people want to stay, they love their country and things like that. So, and that will be key for us moving forward. So I think that's something we have to capitalize more, so. Yeah, can I? Can I, do I, I was <laughs> just going to say, I know you're really passionate I, about I, this. You the, 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 this one, here from a few angles, uh, number one, to add a, add a stat for Denny here, uh, Denny here, is in the next couple of years, we, we currently have just about 100,000 open technology roles in this country. That's going to double in the next couple of years to 200,000. And we fundamentally have to, asp have to activate our entire population. I, I had a few comments, and uh, no offense to the demographics in the room, but I was speaking with some females uh, here. Uh, this panel is not representative of society, and I'm sorry I wasn't born a lady. I'm born a man. I came from Saskatchewan. That's differential right there. But, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, yesterday I was, I was in a panel uh, where we talked about diversity and from the age of uh, our youth, uh, we recently did something called a Skype-a-thon where we activated half a million students who traveled 14 million miles. And I connected in with a classroom, and these are grade fives. And they went through with me this phenomenal design, build, pure structural engineering models of these kids in grade five figuring out technology and how to bring pro products to market and they were boys and their girls presenting and then we got in the room and i asked this group a provocative question and these are you know grade fives they're all over technology and i said so it, it was on purpose do you guys think that do you got do you guys love technology and all the hands go up and they're jumping up and down and i said well is technology and science is it really just for boys and there was a visceral reaction from this group of no, of course not. What do you mean? There's no way. Technology is for everyone. And it, as we think about this industry, our industry, which is about an 80-20 split on average, CBC just did, a, just did an expose, 5% of uh, the leaders in technology or founders are female, 13% is the average number of organizations uh, of, of females that are on organizations' leadership teams. 
we are not going to drive the brain power, yeah. the capability, and the full ideology of us being successful on a global stage unless we alter that Thank dialogue. You, yeah. And so, you know, this, this is one of, I, I think my, all my colleagues are going, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> we, we, we are active, and I know everyone on this panel are active in this dialogue of being men who advocate real change. And, and I think as an industry for everybody here, I've got a 12-year-old daughter. I want my 12-year-old daughter to have the ability to engage in our industry in a fundamental way equal to anyone else. And we, everyone in this room has a responsibility. We need to take it back to our companies and discuss it. Because the supply side of Canada's industry needs uh, all of us. Dan, at the, risk of, at the risk of piling on on this one, um, like we're missing out on 50% of the population. Potential. The supply yeah. challenge uh, that Kevin talked about is you know, 200,000 jobs that are going to go un unfilled. The only way we solve that is getting to a much more diverse workforce. Right. And it actually has to start all the way back at K to 12. Um, and so there's, there's a bunch of initiatives that if people want to get involved in, CCICT and ITAC have a whole program to convince girls coming up through high school that a career in technology is actually an exciting and fun thing to do and they need role models, et cetera. So we can't start it at the university level. It has to start way back in um, primary school. But this is probably the number one technology challenge I think we face going forward. Thanks, I, I want to just add to that too. <clears throat> this, the stats should also show that the earlier that you introduce technology to, um, to children, um, the, the actual, the, 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 the fork in the road doesn't happen, right? So, so it's equal if you introduce technology yep. to, to girls and boys mm -hmm. at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned Singapore. Singapore, just a little while, I mean, they bought, they, they invested like in a million, they bought a million Chromebooks for their students, right? They are, they're investing in their children and investing in the education. I think it's important for us as a society, it's important for us as voters to to really force our elected officials to really begin that investment at a much younger age. Because it can't start at university. It's too late then. It's done. I have a daughter who's 13 years old. She phoned me the other day, Daddy, I coded today. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for organizations. I think, yeah, here's the coding. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the other thing is that this digital transformation or this, this you know, phenomena that we're in right now, I think number one, it's colorblind which I think is a fantastic mm -hmm. thing. And I think it's, it's gender neutral, which it, it has the opportunity to be. 56% of Shopify's web stores, their merchant stores are run by females, mm -hmm. right? It gives, it, this, this phenomena that we're in the middle of right now gives everybody an equal opportunity. And we need to, we need to prepare everybody at a much younger age to take advantage of it because Although ML and AI right now, Canada is considered to be the destination, if not the top, top two or three. The, the other organizations and other countries that invest in this and have the people can very easily take that position over in, in very short order. So we need to continue to invest in our people at much, much, much younger ages. I agree. And, and um, it's interesting when you mention Shopify or when you look internationally at like microloans in India or what have you. Great participation of women in small businesses, yeah. less representation in the kinds of, obviously, in the sorts mm -hmm. of businesses represented. Well, we're very, we're we do have a women in technology panel later. No, I know, but we're, I mean, we're like 90, you know, 98 percent of the businesses in Canada are small businesses, right? right. So, so I think there is such a huge opportunity for us to take advantage of that and, and, and really invest. Since so you I'm going to sort of pile on to what Jim <laughs> just said with regards to Singapore. So I'm a former Singaporean. I was born there grew up there for the first 10 years of my life. And I can honestly, honestly say, if it wasn't for the government investment in education and technology, I wouldn't be where I am today. But the fantastic thing I'm hearing about this day and age is that they're finally doing away with the stigma of women yeah. not being in technology, <laughs> mathematics, basic sciences. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's an organizational thing, which is fantastic. So just a comment on that. But I want to go back to what Mark said earlier about Canadian companies and marketing ourselves internationally. I think Canadian companies right now do a fantastic job of marketing ourselves internationally. You know, being at Equinix, we have, as Andrew alluded to, we have 190 data centers globally. So we've got a unique perspective in that we see a ton of Canadian companies. We're talking about uh, advertisement exchanges, payment, digital payment processing, 
um, even uh, supply chain management that are blowing up internationally. And I can't think of a better way to describe that. But nobody is aware of them at home. Hmm. Yeah. At all. Zero. There's zero local awareness of these companies. In the region, we're talking Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, doing great things internationally. How do we build that awareness here? And how do we get ourselves as a country to eat our own food? Does well, that make sense? You know, that's a great point. And, and there are, I mean, clearly there's a lot of enthusiasm for progress, but there are real obstacles to Canada developing leadership in, in digital transformation as well. What could you? And sorry, I just want to add one more thing to what I was going to say. Okay. I think a good chunk of it, and as I was, sorry, I'm thinking as I'm speaking here, which I apologize, I, I have a bad <laughs> habit of doing. One of those things is that whole data residency thing I came about, right? I was talking mm -hmm. about initially. Because companies locally find it really hard. How do we serve our own people without having a strong presence in Canada? I mean, face facts, 30 million people, of which one of the consumers for all of this, 1% of that? So how do we build that infrastructure out? And from an Eastern Canada perspective, fantastic. We are very network dense, mm -hmm. uh, delivery dense. Western Canada, you're good luck, right? Good luck. I mean, what is it? One fiber optic uh, path from east to west with that's what, 70% occupied now last, last, uh, last time I looked? It's a very interesting issue we have as a country. Traditional data pathways don't go east-west yeah. in Canada anyway. Right, Lord, did, did you? Well, sorry. <laughs> sorry. On, on the uh, on the impediments, um, uh, like for innovation to happen, like diverse perspectives, which we talked about a lot, right? Or really, really, it's one of the great great structural advantages that we have in Canada is how do we leverage those diverse perspectives. But you also need you know combination of the ideas plus capital plus you know a will to try things. And you know the good news is we're starting to see that that push in Canada, whether it's the incubators, accelerators, the tech sector here in Toronto that you can see, you know, Vancouver, you know, we're starting to see a bunch of the elements to say, hey, let's take the cadence up and ensure that these companies are, are funded, and how do we drive at a much higher speed? And of course, traditionally, Canadians, you know, more reserved, more slow moving. I think a big element of success, an impediment that we have to get over is how do we as a group go faster? And that's not, we're not waiting for, we don't wait for other people to go faster. We ourselves have to drive change faster within our organizations with technology adoption. Uh, and, and to me, that's a big one. And like, I'll give a very specific, and it's us as businesses, it's also, you know, a government. Like for us on, you know, one of our big impediments is access to Spectrum. Spectrum is our lifeblood. And you know, we're, we're kind of stuck waiting for Spectrum that we need of a government process that's just taking way too long. And, mm -hmm. and like, it's, how do we take the government, businesses, all of us, increase that cadence? Because I see the good signs of, hey, the talent plus money plus ideas, but how do we improve the cadence? And I think that's one of the big parts of we have to take ownership as a group to say we're going to go faster. Terry, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I just, um, I'll, I'll put a shout out to my, my federal government colleague here. Hopefully those of you read the newspaper this morning, federal government announced their innovative solutions initiative. So that is all about changing the procurement basis. And, and they did a very simple thing. They took 22, I think, I think the number is 22 ministries and said, you are going to have to spend 1% of your R&D budget on Canadian technology, startup technologies, emerging technologies, mm -hmm. and buy Canadian. 1%, mm -hmm. just 1%. That amounts to $100 million, actually, when you look at it. If each of our companies actually did that and took 1%, 2%, 5% of our expenditures and bought Canadian technologies, fundamentally changes and accelerates the trajectory. Okay, as so, I, as so I travel- So build off that then. Where, where are the, uh, what, if that's seed money for these companies, where are our opportunities to build first and best uh, suppliers to take that money and use it to grow? On In terms of growth basis? areas for export, et yes, cetera? Yes, um, As we look at the exponential technologies and what are the growth, growth areas, there's a few obvious ones. So AI, we've talked about a bit, but Canada has an absolute amazing opportunity to seize the day on that. Three of the biggest brains in the AI space, in fact, created deep mm -hmm. machine learning right. with Jeffrey Hinton, now at, at, at Google. As <laughs> Jim's already created, got him, though. So. As, <laughs> no, no, but Jeffrey is doing his part to actually help the country, right? Participating on the Vector Institute, working on driving that out. So you got Jeffrey Hinton. You got Joshua Bengio in Montreal, you know, part of University of Montreal and driving out Mila, the whole Montreal Institute for Learning and Algorithms, and Richard Sutton out in Alberta. So we actually have three of the global leaders, three, three, unfortunately three. all guys right now, we'll get some more women into that mix, but three of the, the global leaders across Canada, we need to seize the day on that opportunity. 
The world is actually figuring it out. So Thomson Reuters, great Canadian company that's global in nature, put their AI, their only AI center of development in Toronto. 400 people is their starting ante. They're gonna go to 1,200. Mm -hmm. Google, how many guys do you have here in Canada on this? So, so the world is figuring out that Canada has this kind of talent. We now have to figure out how to leverage it, how to export it. So AI, no brainer, but got to double down on it. So I happen to run our AI strategy for Deloitte. We're going full on in on, on this, both internally of how do we apply digital AI to ourselves, as well as what we do with our clients. Uh, cyber, the world is very worried about cyber. There are a whole bunch of cyber companies that have Russian roots. Mm -hmm. People are saying, well, maybe that's not such a good thing right now, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, we need to wake up that's to that. That's called we, creating your own industry. We, well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Supply and demand, right? Um, this crowd might appreciate the joke. I used to laugh about Irv Weinstein and Channel 7, WKBW. Irv would report all the fires. There was fire in Tonawanda yeah. and Chictawaga. I think somebody else was out setting them. Uh, and, and, uh, um, minor uh, digression. I was wondering but, why that was new. <laughs> yeah. What made that news? So, so, so cyber, though, let's talk about cyber for a sec. So we did a project for TFSA, the Toronto Financial Services Alliance, with Jana Ecker, and they wanted to understand, did we have the right ingredients for Canada and, in fact, Toronto to be a cyber center for the world. And so we went through and did the study, looked at it all, and we had a lot of very good aspects. We were number three at the time behind Silicon Valley, then Israel, specifically Beersheba in Israel, mm -hmm. and uh, then we were the third. By the time, literally in the three months that we published and before they actually rolled it out, we became fourth, because the UK woke up and said, oh, the cyber thing's pretty important. So like, we have got to get the accelerator down on some of these things. So cyber, big deal. So AI, cyber, and then um, I would think FinTech is another one that we've got a nice concentration of capability. We have not done the same job that Israel and others have to go tackle FinTech, but it's an opportunity for us for sure. And then there are some outliers that wouldn't necessarily be uh, things that come to mind, but agriculture and food processing, yes. big deal for the country. We should be the dominant player in that space around the technology, not yet something that we've grabbed and seized. I think, you know, there's obviously lots of discussion on uh, autonomous vehicles and batteries and all of that. We're not yet positioned to actually go. There's 140 autonomous vehicle companies in China. Mm -hmm. Not autonomous vehicle manufacturers that produce a battery, autonomous vehicle companies, a la Tesla, et cetera. 140 companies. So, we're going to have to step on the accelerator if we're going to want to go be dominant in that space, but there's a real opportunity. Yeah, and I think that just to pile on and then perhaps pivot to something else, but every 15 years we get a Nortel, we get a Blackberry, now everybody's a bit hyped about the guys at Shopify and the good work that they're doing. But if we don't figure out kind of the, just the pure science of it, that data is increasing exponentially, if you plug devices around the world, the speed of light only travels so fast. So the idea of this kind of long haul back into Canada where the magic happens and then exporting from here yeah. really has to be broken as a model and you have to get into more of a distributed architecture where your workloads and where you're monetizing your data happens closest to where your suppliers yeah. and customers are. Absolutely. Yeah. So this idea that somehow we don't, we don't have to take a big bang approach from an investment perspective, we've got to incubate the best of what Canada can export and then distribute those little pockets of intelligence around the world. There's more people in Canada um, potentially than there are in, in other countries that are developing like we are uh, uh, as well, but they're exporting it better. Yeah. I, I, I fervently believe that because there's nobody in Israel talking about us right now. Yeah. I think there, there's, a, if I may, there, j just leveraging off of that, uh, I'm not a political guy. I kind of sit on the fence. It makes dinner parties at home easier with the family, extended family. <laughs> but. The government is doing a couple of cool things here. The super cluster investment, for those who don't know, is a billion dollars of matched funds around making it real with four to five different uh, areas, making it real around everything from agriculture of the future through to telecoms, through to financial services, et cetera. Just, just some fundamental investment to build that IP pot for Canada. And it's also great to see some support on the city of the future initiative that the sure. government's putting in. So we, that's good. Small dollars, really. Sorry, go ahead. So I just wanted to add on, 
it sounds like you guys know more about what we're doing than I do. Uh, <laughs> we pay attention. It's important. It's, it's online. You can, you can find it. Yeah, exactly. But I, I wanted to get back to the, the comment about the pace and the, the, the need for speed of innovation, because that's the one thing that I agree, I think, is one of the most critical um, enablers. And one of the, the most deep-seated cultural changes we have to make is mm -hmm. let's go quickly, let's iterate, mm -hmm. let's make things happen, and let's fail. And let's yeah. learn from the failures and you. move on. Fail so we are really trying to make that, that cultural change. That's a very, very hard cultural change because the entire organization, the entire industry, if you call government industry, is about risk aversion, protection. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have the public trust, we, we have responsibilities, and we take those very seriously, but those should not be the things that hold us back. They should be the things where we create safe spaces, uh, the innovation centers, the, those investments, where we are able to, to iterate quickly and learn from them and get things done. We actually, uh, at the SMB Cloud Summit that we held yesterday, that notion of Canadians being averse to failure mm -hmm. at all and Americans embracing yep. the fail fast and taking that as a badge of honor was uh, held up as one of the big differences between the countries. Um, Jim, in our conversation, we were talking about stuff that kind of echoes on a lot of this. Can you please finish the phrase in however many different ends you, you choose to use? Data is the new and then kind of extend out into what that means for Canadian business? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's interesting, you know, kind of like Kevin, I, I get a, an opportunity to talk to a, a lot of different leaders in a lot of diff different industries. And, um, you know, I was at a, a, a bank a little while ago and, and the executive said, you know, data is the new currency. Mm -hmm. And um, later on the next day, I was in Calgary and I met an oil and gas firm and, and the executive said, you know, data is the new oil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I went to a pretty significant transportation logistics company. Said data is a new cargo, <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, well, so so clearly data is a commodity, and um, and I think what we need to learn how to do better. Um, we talk about ML, we talk about AI, and, and a lot of you know Vector Institute and Neela and whatnot, which we've invested very very heavily in. Those are pure science. And now what we need to do is kind of maybe, you know, uh, we need to raise that up a little bit right. so we can apply that science. Um, I was with an individual yesterday talking about um, uh, agriculture, actually. So we're working with this technology using, you know, vision APIs and machine learning. I didn't realize this, but in, on, a, on a yearly basis, a typical Canadian farm, the yield varies 40%. Wow. And I was like, so can you imagine running your business each, you know, going into every January 1st, not knowing whether or not you're going to have a 40% either delta or, 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 you know, degrading in your business. So I think what the opportunity for Canada is to, is for organizations to really take it up a notch. We're seeing this now with organizations like Element AI, and there's a lot of, you know, dot AI companies that are now starting to form to really yes. begin, how do we mine Mm -hmm. this data and Bruce talked about 92% could be 99% of unused data an interesting fact here is um, today I'm not sure if you realize it or not but if you do a Google search for your hairdresser or your your Chinese food takeout place and you see the hours of operation um, and I'm sure you've seen it yes. the hours of operation the hours of operation actually come from our street view imagery that we've captured huh. that's where that that's just captured from the, the the sign that's on the front door of the building. That's where that, that's where that information co comes from. And that's because we've, we, we don't, we had it was 92% maybe unused at some particular point in time, but now as technology has increased, we're now able to go back and apply machine learning to that historical pot of data. Another interesting example here of where you can take advantage of this, and it's really, simply by the application of the technologies that they're, that they're refining in, in Mila and, and the Vector Institute. So in, in, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Google Fiber in the United States, we started this, and, and in order for us to, to, so maybe there's an opportunity here for TELUS, but uh, there, when we started to try to map where the, where the routes went, I mean, it was a, we had to send people out, look at polls, all the other nonsense. And so our guys are like, okay, hold on, there's gotta be a better way. So we, combed the street view data, found the polls, we did a, you know, some analytics based on the data that we just already had as inventory and then we were able to do it. We could map a full state in the matter of three hours as opposed to matching one route which would take us three weeks. 
So I think the opportunity for Canada is elevating the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence, into a, uh, you know, no longer from a science perspective, but in applied science. Yeah. Thanks. Ash, you haven't said a word yet. So <laughs> can, you, can you kind of pitch in here with sure. some of your own observations on where the strengths and weaknesses for Canada in this context lie? Well, so just to dovetail on the data, I mean, it's absolutely, as we've all heard, and, and I'm sure we've uh, read statistics, the, the volume of data is going to grow. I mean, already today, companies have a lot of unused data. So the, the key is how do you leverage that? How do you leverage that to make decisions to get a competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. I mean, from a Canada perspective, I think there's lots of opportunity to collaborate better from a government, private sector, universities, um, you know, financing organizations, whether it's you know, pre-IPO or post. So if we look at models around the world, whether it's Silicon Valley or other models of communities that have created and fostered creativity and growth of innovation. I think we have a lot of opportunity in Canada. So, so where do Canadian companies need to invest to start grasping that opportunity and, and developing it out so we don't go into the future that Terry describes to his kids? To <laughs> <laughs> right. I describe a very bright future, but there's a downside <laughs> if you don't attend. Sure, sure. So from an enterprise perspective, there's three areas that enterprises can look to invest in. First and foremost, it's a customer. How do you transform the customer experience? How do you get more intimate with your customers? How do you build that customer loyalty? How do you sell them the products and services that they want and need? How do you take their feedback and, and, and incorporate that into the enterprise to be better at serving them? Mm -hmm. right? So there's a whole set of, of topics around customer experience and, uh, and helping an organization to transform and create that digital transformation through centering around the customer and really building a whole set of processes and really the business process, not necessarily re-engineering, but focusing on a set of business processes to improve how an organization operates. Mm -hmm. And you know, from a CenturyLink perspective, we look at this from either innovation or cost reduction. As we talk to customers around digital transformation, we start with that oftentimes with executives and we say, do you want to innovate faster? Do you want to get faster time to market? products out sooner and what do you need to do from an infrastructure perspective to do that because we're infrastructure experts right network cloud hosting and so forth and then the cost reduction so really uh, by improving processes you can significantly reduce cost and the third area is business models really looking at the business model that you currently operate in and then looking at others in the industry I mean, companies are being disrupted, as I said earlier, right? Industries, entire industries are being disrupted. Now it's almost, uh, it's taken for granted, whether it's a retail industry or the publishing industry, banking, right? It's industry by industry, they're being disrupted. So the question really is, at a leadership level, how much, uh, how much vision and support do senior leaders have? I mean, the example that, that Terry gave, right, starting it, starting inside the organization, transforming an organization from within, but also serving customers better. So I think those are all areas, again, focusing on customers, focusing on business processes, and then the business model. I think there, there's a piece here of what are the innate skills that are available within the firm, but the, the dialogue to me has to shift as well around what are the capabilities and understanding of the business functions around the ideation of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And if we see most organizations, it's like, oh, we're, we're going to set up a digital transformation group or a garage or a think tank or a division. And really, we need to educate the functional silo groups around what is possible with mm -hmm. the technology that's available. Uh, another di dialogue I had with, uh, with the CEO, he was hiring, I think he's hired now 55 PhD scientists, data scientists, and they're having trouble getting output from that. And I kind of question that type of an investment. There's a couple of organizations on this panel who have deep investments in AI. Uh, you know, we have 8,000. PhD scientists, engineers, et cetera, embedding AI through the entire product set, putting it as a platform layer across cloud around the world. Uh, I think the focus really needs to be on what's the strategic intent, 
And then how do we tie that strategic intent to what is potentially possible and then just iterate and activate, iterate and activate. There's too much sitting on, on the back foot of, well, this sounds like a good idea, but I don't know what to do. We just need to dig in and get something done. Thanks. Two of you actually flagged me. Denis, do you want to speak quickly? Yeah, and so one thing I think, so, so Canada is really an SMB country, right? SME, so, and I think we, as an industry, we need to find a way to change the mindset of those entrepreneurs because so they get, they understand, many of them understand, so I, like the transformation happening and stuff like that. But it's really in the doing, right? That really, so not seeing, perceiving ICT as just like running the business stuff, like really having IT to transform their business model and everything and make it really as a, a transformational thing for their companies. And that's talking with, with SMB, that's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they understand they're gonna modernize their platform and stuff like that, but really to be inside the strategy and see how I can change everything. So we're not there yet. So I think we have a long way to go that, and it's critical for the country that we one of that. the One of the sayings in our Cloud SMB Summit yesterday was, everybody's focused on step 17 with AI or whatever, but there's value mm -hmm. in steps one and two and three <laughs> as well. Well done. <laughs> and yeah. Terry, did you want to add on? Yeah, just a couple of quick thoughts. We. Um, we have a whole group called Deloitte Digital, and we've quietly become the world's largest digital agency. Not something that we're, we're kind of Canadian in our, in our marketing <laughs> DNA. We don't trumpet it as much as we probably should. But um, one of the things that that group said, and Gord Sanford leads the practice here in Canada, and, and he said, here's the deal. Like, everybody is talking about doing digital, and everybody's talking about digital transformation. Right. What we really need to be building into our DNA, and this is a little bit of where Kevin was going, is how are we actually being digital? And we had, we had a group of our, our staff that said, hey, we keep getting calls on, train me on this digital aspect or that digital aspect, et cetera. And they said, okay, we're just gonna create a little digital academy. We didn't give them a bunch of money to go do it. We created a digital academy that our staff were just you know, cranking. They wanted to share their knowledge with you know, some of the older people that needed some more training on it. Um, and it became then an offering that we said, we have to have every one of our practitioners go through. And now our clients are actually calling us for that. And, and it, but it, it pervades everything. So how are we doing conferences? When we do a conference it, or a workshop, it's actually digitally captured and the results are available right at the end of the conference. We're leveraging AI into some of the research that feeds it. So how do we, and, and by the way, we're no, by no means done that journey. But um, when you start to think about being digital versus doing digital, it changes the lens that you put on it and, and how you think about it inside your organization. So yeah, how, how can it? So here, just start super quick. <laughs> we've, got, okay. we've got companies and organizations that say they want to go digital, and the CIO, CTO is buried beneath the chief operating officer, the, the chief CFO. financial. They're not even at the table. Yeah. They're not even at the leadership table. How are they going to infuse right. technology yeah. within and I, the business? And I think that's where that gap between, yeah. and, and Mark, I wanted to ask you, since you are the CTO, I mean, every organization at some point, the leadership team is going to claim, we're digitally transformed, you know? And, but, but I mean, what does that transformation look like? What's, what's an indication that you've actually done something other than, you know, do the un-Canadian thing of tooting your right. own horn without right. actually accomplishing much? <laughs> so, so I think the, the true end state when you know you've arrived in, is when it's unthinkable to launch a new process, a new, a new service that isn't end-to-end -end digital. Like it just, mm -hmm. it becomes permeated through your DNA. Um, I just read recently, I'll share this anyways. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I realized that maybe I shouldn't share this. <laughs> An organization is, uh, is dealing with new legislation that was recently passed that is going to be changing the agricultural landscape of Canada. You can all guess what that means. Um, and their, their business process was how they were going to deal with paper forms. And, and we're going, this is a brand new business. This is a new line of business that exists in Canada. How are we going to deal with forms? Betw and it was between two organizations in, internally. So that, that's just a signal that that is not in our DNA. The, 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 and someone mentioned it just a, a few seconds ago, the, the difference between 
the technology and the process, you have to focus on changing the process and the people mm -hmm. that are involved in that, in, in delivering those services so that it truly is end-to-end -end digital. And I'm a firm believer, it starts with training. We, I think we should do the same thing. I think we should train. Sometimes you just have to get out of the Sometimes you just have to get out of the way of innovation because it happens yeah. in spite of itself in organizations where they did a survey with millennials and they said, does IT enable your innovation? They said they innovate in spite of IT. Uh, so they basically treat IT as the library that they have to go and sign a book out of that takes a lot of time and has records that are more important than the actual content, whereas they're on Google. Or and, and, and doing that's it as the CIO themselves. dilemma, right? So, so that, that, that kind of invigorating it as a culture and letting it happen and letting it evolve, because we might not have the right idea of how to line up the resources. We've got to kind of just get out of the way and let it happen. And, and sometimes yeah. you just have to jump in head first. Sorry, sometimes you have to jump in head first. Equinix is a great example of that. Two years ago, we weren't in the cloud, period. I mean, think about it. We have 190 data centers. It costs us nothing to host servers, literally, <laughs> absolutely nothing. Right. We have an IAC, we have internet exchanges, a whole nine. Bupkis. But two years ago, we encountered a very interesting issue, and our CIO saw this. Thankfully, Brian saw this. It was, what are our customers going through? What transformation are they undertaking? And overnight, they made the decision, saying, okay, forget it. Exchange is shut down. We're going to Office 365. Right? Then that began the journey, step one. Then they started moving all of the infrastructure into the cloud. Right? And we deal with all the hyperscalers, so we have infrastructure in all three of the major hyperscalers. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy if you see the organization from two years ago to today. Now we have an SSI group. And the sole focus of that group is innovation, digital innovation, and to put ourselves in our customers' mindset. What are our customers doing? What are our partners doing? And how are we innovating with them alongside them? Lloyd, you've been very patient. I was going to say, like, one, of, one of the best ways we know, you know that we're making progress on the digital transformation journey is actually ask our customers. If you see your net promoter scores going up, the customers have more faith in you, more trust in you, the brand's resonating with them, and a lot of it's driven because you're making it effortless for them to do business with you. Mm -hmm. So go ask them and see what they tell you, and if they tell you you're making progress, you know you're making progress. And we see it's a direct relationship between our net promoter score and our digital transformation journey. That affinity is so strong, you make it easy for our customers to do business with you, they build, it builds trust with them, and you can see it directly in a net promoter score. So just go yeah. ask those customers. Could, couldn't agree on more of that. I think the other test is your employees, right? And so net promoter score for customers, <laughs> net promoter score for employees, because often we do nice things for the customers, but we don't actually look after them. What employees. a wonderful bridge. What, what jobs will be created in or, or, or changed within enterprises that are successful at this? You want me to go at that one? Or, or you can oh. let Ash go ahead and yeah, start. Yeah, start. Sure. Go You're going to jump in at some point anyway. Go, 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 go. So, so I think from a people and skills perspective, it really starts at the top. I think senior leadership really needs to understand and, and fund, quite frankly, okay. initiatives. Right? And we've touched on this a couple of times. Right? Okay. Fail fast, be a fast follower. Either be an innovator or a fast follower. And I wanted to share an example of a customer that I spent some time with recently. It's a, we did a, a little strategy workshop with the chief strategy officer of a major global manufacturing firm. And uh, his, his main mission was just to, to, just to learn, right? He came in and he was meeting his key suppliers and, and learn about the technologies that could help him transform the business. And his CEO had told him that in four years we have to transform our business or we're out of business. Right. And, and this fellow, as we went through and learned about his business, there were more organizational issues and technology issues. Right. Right? There, there were about five major divisions in this company, and this person reported to the CIO of one of the divisions. Mm -hmm. But as he talked about his journey on digital transformation, it started with forming a committee. It started with uh, getting everyone on board, doing an inventory of what they had going on. But he talked about the political pressure he was getting from the other divisions. And at the end of the session, I took him aside and said, you will fail unless you get CEO sponsorship. That's right. And, and I, I actually felt bad for him because I said, you've got a tremendous mandate. But just based on what I had heard, it was all of these other business issues that needs top-down sponsorship with initiatives, proof points, and, and wins. OK, I want to reserve some time for questions from the audience. But before we do, I do want to dig down to what digital transformation means to jobs and to roles in Canada. Terry, maybe, or Terry, maybe you can get us started, and then Jim, if you want to 
hop right in on that. I know both of you were interested in that topic. We, we've spent a lot of time on the future of work, and I'm fortunate to have the leader, Heather Stockton, who is driving a bunch of our global future of work research, uh, is based here in Toronto. Um, and so everybody's talking about all the jobs are going away, AI is coming, connected cars coming, you know, interesting stat. It's something like 41 of the, of the US states, the number one job in the state is driver. Driver of cars, driver of cabs, driver of ambulances, et cetera. So you think about autonomous vehicles. By the way, the, the number's not very different for Canada. Um, so there's a lot, if you read McKinsey reports, and you're never supposed to mention other, um, but they go on the dark side. It's all, all the jobs are going away, the world is ending. Uh, et cetera. We, we're actually much more optimistic about the world. We think a lot more jobs are going to get created. If you look at every industrial revolution we've gone through, the same thing is coming. Okay, the, the horse is going away, the car's coming, every job's going away, right? So um, agricultural industry to the industrial uh, revolution, you know, every job's going away. Humans are resilient. We've actually migrated and done stuff. So there's going to be a whole bunch of new jobs. We think there are a whole new categories. So if, if you look at the organizations, the challenge is, it's going to fundamentally challenge how we think about structures of companies. We believe that you know, things like the rise of the independent worker, crowdsourcing, et cetera, are going to be a big deal. Um, there are way more smarter people outside of Deloitte than there are inside Deloitte. We're a pretty great and awesome company, uh, 250,000 people worldwide, but there are millions outside of our company that are even smarter than some of the players we have inside. So how do we take advantage of that and leverage both technology and other stuff? So organizations are going to need to think about a few critical skills, scanning and sensing. How do you actually find all the new technologies that are going on? I was recently in Israel. We had a global innovation meeting there two years ago, and there were no Canadian companies posted there. You know, there were Australian companies, there were British companies, US companies, no Canadian companies. I went on a mandate with our banks to say, guys, like you got to wake up. Like FinTech, blockchain, cyber, all happening in Israel. If you're not there, you're going to get beaten by the other guys. So we got outside. So, so the point there is you need a scanning capability inside your organization that figures out how to tap into this. Our scanning guys in Israel look at 50 startups a week to figure out which ones are interesting and worthwhile to work with. Ecosystems, fancy, you know, 25 cent consulting world, but the reality is. Are you plugged into ecosystems that matter? Are you plugged into Communitech and what's going on there? 111, Mars. Are you plugged into Google's development network, Microsoft's development network, Salesforce, others, right? Are you, are you actually building out into those ecosystems? Are you doing your own thing inside your company? So scanning and sensing important. Ecosystem management, figuring out the partnerships with academic institutions, with the government, with um, you know, the development and the innovative companies, that's going to be really important. Uh, and then just figuring out how to be an agile organization, so how to nimbly, dynamically construct uh, organizations inside your company is going to be a big deal. We believe also there is going to be the rise of creativity. We're hiring OCAD grads and other grads that are into design, that are into storytelling, that are into visualization. Um, in addition, like I'm an engineer from the University of Waterloo, so I'm a big fan of the tech side. But tech plus creative is what's going to make the magic happen out in the in the field with the clients. So, Jim, if you look forward, how do you see jobs changing or being created based so, on that? I'm just going to add one thing to that because I think uh, I think the tech is the table stakes. You know, those mm -hmm. are just every company is going to have to have them. I think over the last 10 or 15 years, organizations. Certainly the larger ones, they've kind of outsourced their intellectual property. Um, now they need to bring it back in. I was uh, talked to an EVP of one of the telcos a little while ago, and I said, you know, what's your, what's your data strategy? He said, Oracle. I said, okay. What's your API strategy? Uh, it's CA. I said, okay. What's your, you know, your, your network uh, strategy? Cisco. Well, those aren't actually strategies. Those are vendors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and it, was, it was actually a daunting conversation. I think the most important thing, one of the most important things, tech is the table stakes. I think creative thinking um, and uh, creativity in how you apply the technology is probably one of the most important things. If you really look at it, the jobs, jobs are not changing, right? The job doesn't change. It's, it's what's how the job is being done okay. is changing. Mm -hmm. And we have all of this amazing technology available to us, and we're reinventing 
the exact same process in this beautiful and amazing technology. Uber and, I mean, these are cliches now, Uber and Airbnb, those are actually just cliches. But it's, it's simply a, the technology today is allowing for you to create a change in the business model. And that, I think, is the biggest opportunity and the biggest opportunity for disruption. And we have a, a CEO of one of our banks he, we deal with, he goes, actually, C Canadians don't need banks. They need banking. Mm -hmm. And so it's now, how do I provide that service to Canadians in a much easier fashion? And, and I think for Mark, you know, I had to call Revenue Canada yesterday. I still haven't been able to get a hold of them. And I had to call three times and there's no answers. I think you're going to realize you're there when I can do that on my phone. So Mark, yeah. what, what <laughs> skills do we need to do to... to so I, I, I agree with, with what everyone's been saying about this. There's, there's a new field that I think is also going to emerge. Ethical and transparent yeah. computing. And because we aren't going to flip the switch. We aren't going to automatically turn over, to use your, your analogy, the, the tax auditing functionality to a computer tomorrow. That's just not going to happen. The especially decisions where where uh, you go right to audit. It wasn't an audit. Well, was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah, assumed yeah, no, 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 Get a little close to home. Yeah, yeah, I had an RSP <laughs> question. God, man, like, how do you do it? Um, but applying for citizenship, Should applying for a passport, that. all mm -hmm. sorts of functions, especially in the government. But I think this is going to apply uh, in the financial industry. We're applying for for credit or or any other products where there will be an expectation to be able to understand the process, what happened, why was I denied a loan, why was I, mm -hmm. why was I audited. Um, those are things that, that if AI is doing those types of things, there's lots of reasons why that's a good thing, but there will be lots of new requirements to oversee those functionalities, to understand how they work, to understand how they are, uh, they are being applied the way we intended them to be applied. So I think that's going to be another way where um, the shift is going to be about the, the computer human partnership, yes. and, and that's going to create a whole new set of jobs. And Mary, uh, my partner, has been doing a bunch of work into the uh, uh, ethical algorithm. Yep. Can I just add, add one quick Please. one to that? Um, I really believe in playing to our strengths, right? So while we need to in increase the speed that we work things at, if you look at, you know, Canada's a leaded, leading trusted party, you know, security by design, privacy by design. Mm -hmm. So those the AI, you, so you take those areas and you say, okay, explainable AI, transparency on how do we deal with that data. There are so many strengths that are here in Canada that, that we can leverage that I think it, like, I'm really, really optimistic because we have so many of the elements, how do we put them together? And that whole, you know, transparency on a transaction, explainable AI, we know it's a, the, the fourth in security. We lead the world on privacy by design. Like, we lead in trusted healthcare providers. We lead in trusted banking. Like there's so many inherent strengths here if we can if we can begin to leverage them. And yeah. I'm not sure which session it is, but like Dr. Ann Kavukian, who's yeah, one of the leaders in that, is she's talking actually today, right, right after this. Yeah, yeah. opposite our uh, great panel. Uh, may I may I ask the audience a question? You know, Kevin, I was going to ask you to kind of close this segment up because I know you're passionate <laughs> you about go. skills. Anyway. Well, well, no, I, I, I didn't want go to ahead. take a job. So uh, I, I think this is a this is a loaded question, but by show of hands, how many folks, in, how many people in the audience are in technology and have been in the technology for at least five years, ten years? Pretty much everyone. Yeah, that's everybody. So here, here's the deal: is that uh, you know, whichever study you look at. We talked about the 100 to, uh, to 200,000 open jobs. A uh, recent study by a competitor of my friend uh, over at McKinsey is by 2030, 13 years goes by in a flash, 30 to 50 million new jobs in technology. All of us, all of you, we won't be redundant. But what is inherent within this transformation is just like we went from PC to client server, we went from mainframe to distributed networks, and now we're in this dialogue of moving from owned infrastructure in piece parts to activating global hyperscale cloud environments and building upon that with machine learning, cognitive capabilities and services, advanced intellectual power of the technology and being able to do that anywhere in the world with the flick of a switch, 
everybody in this room can transform. And the future is unbelievably positive, unbelievably positive for this industry. It seems like a great note in which to open up the uh, floor for questions. We'll see if the audience uh, shares your uh, enthusiasm. We have knock me down. <laughs> we have a microphone here. If you have a Make question, please raise your hand. Right over here, we have a question. Barry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you'll be happy. Please introduce yourself. Yes, do, okay, thanks, Bruce. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Barry, I, I know who you are, but you can introduce yourself to everybody else. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Barry Kurt with Tavco, and I see the world through the lens of autonomous vehicles. Um, two things. First of all, I want to strongly disagree with Terry, with what he said earlier. Then I have a question. Um, <laughs> Those Terry mentioned earlier the um, great work being done in China in autonomous vehicles. I think he's understating what's happening here in Canada. Um, there's a wonderful infographic shows that in Ottawa alone, the Ottawa area, there are 70, 70 organizations involved in autonomous and connected vehicles. Wow. Another 50 in the Kitchener Waterloo area. Wow. And companies wow. here in um, Toronto as well and other places. Um, one of the best examples is BlackBerry QNX. It's a Canadian company, as you all know. But that's not a question yet. No, I'm coming to the question. <laughs> <laughs> and we, need, we only have 15 minutes for all the questions. Okay, I'll speed up. But BlackBerry QNX, Canadian company, they've, I don't work for them, but they, if you count today, all the cars made in all the production lines around the world, 60% of them include software from BlackBerry QNX. Wonderful. My question for your Thank mantle you. is this. Um, I, um, I spoke earlier at a cybersecurity conference um, in Ottawa. Big takeaway, everything that's connected is hackable. And that's a big issue for us in the autonomous vehicle industry. Um, as you look ahead, the next five, 10 years, how do you see the dynamic? There's a lot of really talented guys there who are hacking and a lot of other talented guys pushing back. How will that battle evolve? Don't all run, geez, you all wanted to rush at once for the optimistic part of things. Anybody want to oh take boy. the yeah, so he's, cool. he's bringing Let's me go. down. Um, so we'll, oh boy. we'll help sort out Barry's stats later, but on, on the uh, Thomas vehicle stuff, but, because um, I think he misunderstood some of the data, but the, um, on, on yes, this there's a level, space. there's a level issue there. So we're right about. so on IoT, generally speaking, and connected in connected car and the autonomous vehicle being one of the you know most popular and understood examples of it. We are absolutely at a crossroad where it's the wild wild west right now, and mm -hmm. people are implementing IoT applications without actually doing the right ethical hacking and the right mm -hmm. privacy considerations and so on. So. I would predict we're going to get into a space very quickly, and there's some folks working on this in Canada on the East Coast around how do we actually have a certification process where you know that the device that you're buying, whether it's a wonderful Google Home or it's something else like a car, is actually secure and, 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 and um, you can trust it both from a privacy perspective, a hackability perspective, et cetera. It is absolutely clear that the, the dark lords, the hackers, really, like if they could take down Tesla, they would, right? Yes. Um, because that would be an amazing you know, affront to American capitalism, et cetera. Um, no, I, I personally have my money on Elon on this one, but, but so, so we're gonna have to get to a bunch of real standards around how do we actually validate that these devices, and whether it's the old CSA approved for electrical mm -hmm. kind of stuff, we're gonna have to get to that level of regulatory environment, and the regulatory will be a good thing in this instance, because there's gonna be a lot of instances where the devices get hacked, and they're even produced by you know, quality manufacturers, um, and, and we as consumers believe when we buy that device that it's gonna be safe. So I, I think that's gonna rise. Danny? Yeah, so as a Intel, as a manufacturer, right, of silicon and right. being at the foundation of many of the transformation yeah. yes. or the everything around the autonomous vehicle and stuff like that. So we do a lot of work to build that root of trust inside the silicon itself. So basically, when you start up your car or your PC, or whatever, mm -hmm. that you know nothing has been tempered and nothing has been changed in the code and stuff like that. So, and as we evolve to a more uh, 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 um, secure architecture for like especially on the IoT space will be we'll see more and more of those technology moving down the stack and at the silicon level. So thanks. One more answer. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's identity, it's access, it's biometrics, it's uh, connected platforms, uh, it's layers. I think embedded is an assumption of breach. Yeah. And what's critical is how quickly that assumption of breach, how quickly that breach is discovered, known, remediated, yeah. and mended. It, l let's, let's face it, I, I mean, my, Microsoft, or other companies on this planet, we spend billions, billions each year on security and embedded security and monitoring of security on these global platforms. You don't know what you don't know, so it's how fast you respond. An yeah. average length of breach, I think, is somewhere between 250 and 350 yeah. days. Mark, you wanted gonna, to put sorry, you one more answer here? I, I, was, I was just going to say, sort of as a, as a consumer uh, responsible for, for protecting organizations, this is an arms race, and, and we just see that it's, there's no end in sight. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think we're going to see very soon that that arms rate is, is going to not, humans aren't going to be able to keep up with it, and it'll yeah. actually become AI to AI. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree with your, your requirements, but I think that that certification will actually almost have to be real time. Yes. Updatable mm -hmm. in real time, yeah. because right. and, and it's even absolutely like critical. And even it's before good. the certification, I just want to add to what Kevin said, go five levels up. It's as simple as changing a username and password. Right. Look at the latest data breaches that have happened on uh, AWS with, uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, leaving a database with a default admin admin password. Mm -hmm. I read a stat out there that 90% of webcams that people buy that sit in their homes still have the default. same default mm -hmm. password. If you look at the largest botnets in the world, there are a ton of IoT devices, and all these guys are doing is going around to these various webcams and using the manufacturer password that's on the internet. Change Absolutely. your passwords, education. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, next question. Uh, introduce yourself, please. I know you, but. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, Chris Herbert, I'm the co-founder of Silicon Halton, which is a grassroots tech community in Halton region. Um, my question for the gang here is, um, how important is it for all of us to be thinking about developing Canadian entrepreneurs of all ages, including young people, but mm -hmm. there are um, some older folks that want to become tech entrepreneurs and building tech companies that are Canadian owned uh, and that have aspirations to become the next Microsoft or the next, you know, TELUS or the next et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Good. Anybody yeah. who didn't answer the last one, yeah, no. Andrew? From, from our perspective, it's, it's creating an environment or an ecosystem mm -hmm. where you then can collaborate with the others that are winning already. So it is, I think, ill-conceived that somehow you need bricks and mortar and a lot of money to get started. <laughs> some of the things like Mars and others that are available, but just the environments physically where we are and the locations that we have and the networks and the cloud providers and the systems integrators that sit in those buildings and functionally kind of make things happen, any exposure to that is, is, is gonna be a positive thing. Jim, you wanna jump on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, it, for us it's critical. I think we're, we're actually taking a pretty, I can't see it, we're taking a pretty significant um, you know, uh, aim next year actually at small businesses and how we can help. We're we're very involved in the you know the, the what I would call the standard uh, um, incubation sy you know systems and centers that are in the country as well. But now uh, actually partnering with both sides of the business and our advertising and our cloud business to really understand how can we make SMBs successful. A how can you provide a platform? I think to your point, like brick and mortar and all that stuff. That that that's those you don't need any of that yep. anymore. All you essentially need. Yeah, uh, And there's yeah, been so, a historical uh, uh, impediment to that in that Canadian tech entrepreneurs tend to sell at about $50 million. They sell to companies that move the sales and marketing expertise south of the border, leave the engineers here. We get lots of engineering jobs, not too much sales and marketing. And the other, the other, yeah. the other hindrance as well is, is second round funding and things like that, which we're mm -hmm. trying to work on now yep. as well. We've got some programs that we're introducing. Uh, seed and Series A is all, those are, I, I want to say, you know, I'll never say easy. Um, easier, but uh, it's it's advanced. Next, the next level funding is is a critical. So it, issue. it's going to be essential for us to grow out our tech community in Canada. A lot of people think we have a startup problem. We actually don't have a startup problem. We produce 25 percent more startups than the U.S. Mm -hmm. per capita. What we have is a scale up problem, and so mm -hmm. you know the, the point that Michael made around uh, organizations sell or move, etc., at 50 million in, is about the right number. We have to go figure out the scale up and we have to have people like, you know, Tom Jenkins who want to build a right. billion dollar company in Canada and stay in Canada mm -hmm. uh, and be global, but, but yes. really do it. So, so we really need to focus on the scale up part of this equation 
Uh, planting a thousand flowers is not the strategy to change the economy, <laughs> right? So, so we need to focus on the scale up. I applaud Mike Lazaridis, so we, yes. we all talk about Blackberry, but creating the Lazaridis Institute at Laurier is explicitly trying to attack the scale up problem. So that's, th that's an important distinction because a lot of people have this misunderstanding that we have a startup problem, we just need a bunch more startups. That's not actually the solution going forward. I think we we've got a population a density problem though. I think basically <laughs> once you hit Toronto and you're done and then you go Montreal then Calgary, you start to have a lot of diminishing returns for these great assets yeah. that we're producing. Yeah. So it's that leap, it's there, that basically way too much start here and yeah. export quickly if not simultaneously. So we have one more uh, down the end there. I, I was just going to say, like, we all play a role in this too, right? Because we can build procurement processes that, that hurt those little companies, that don't help them, that, don't, yes. that, that get in the way of the scale-up problem. <laughs> like, like, let's own up and like, make sure we don't create those impediments. Let's actually right. embrace it. Right. We, we talk about we need the availability and supply of the talent, plus we need the economic growth. Great well, panel. let's take a role in that. Great panel. It's, I gotta jam my way in here, you guys. Are <laughs> <laughs> and it's Hold on a second. We're, we're, just, we're, we're having a conversation over here. Yeah, 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 I think it needs to be done over a bar, and it's related to your question. To, to what extent do you think this industrial concentration is screwing up the distribution of all this technological insight? I mean, when Google can pay $250,000 for a new grad from Waterloo, a guy like me who runs a small tech company, I don't have a chance. And you go through what you guys pay all the way through, we don't have a chance. Then you go to the banks. The fact is that technology is becoming more and more concentrated in the hands of the monsters, and you know we're the ones who distribute it. We're screwed. Monsters. Monsters. You're not, it's monsters. Mark, I mean, you, you don't so, have to say that. You know what? I'm, I, uh, <laughs> Ouch. I, 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 you know, my wife calls me that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, th there is a reality, which is uh, some firms are big. And frankly, I think they're going to get bigger. Uh, at Microsoft, I was with Satya, our CEO, and we're spending over somewhere between eight and nine billion dollars just on infrastructure this year. 8,000 data scientists, and that number will grow. Uh, what I believe our role is, though, is that as we think about our activation, we have the ability to help scale those organizations that do have the new idea, the breakthrough. Yesterday, uh, in this very conference center, we had 5,000 attendees at a tech summit, just about technology. And we brought one of our ISVs up, a great Canadian startup in the connected car space, uh, Mojo onto the stage, and that was the first time they'd been on a stage with an audience of 5,000 that went global, and we empowered that through our industry solution vendor program. So th there, there is a war for talent. The banks are paying big dollars. There's there are only so many PhD data scientists, PhD specialists in some of these fields that are available. We purchased, uh, you talk about startups, we purchased a company in Montreal invested uh, seven and a half million dollars in University of Montreal, et cetera. What companies can scale like that? It's very, very difficult to be able to make those investments. But fundamentally, you know, uh, if we think of what we're trying to achieve, at least on the Microsoft side, it's to build a platform to allow individuals who have that insight and that idea to be able to go on that platform for free, by the way, for your startup community, mm -hmm. for free on the Azure platform, and test their ideas out with machine learning and these cognitive services, and be able to be the next incubator of that idea. So I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's a bit of a reality of the industry. It is, though, our responsibility to ensure we are active in the communities of developing, populating, and then helping companies go global as well. Sam, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, I'm going to add on to that. So from an Equinix standpoint, we are completely neutral in terms of carrier, cloud providers, all of it. We deal with everybody and we try to kind of sit in the middle so I can, can provide a unique insight into this. We're in a very, very cool time. When I was coming up in this industry, it was very infrastructure driven. You could have had the greatest idea in the world, but if you couldn't figure out how to build that infrastructure, it wasn't going anywhere. Then you had to have the capital to build out that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. As Kevin alluded to, and even with Jim and the Google Cloud Platform, right, same with Azure, you have the ability right now in this day and age, if you have that next 
groundbreaking idea to beta it, test it, deploy it in a matter of days. Get it online, test it, field test it, and then go to market and decide, do I want to actually do this or not? Right? The fact that companies like Google, Microsoft, CenturyLink, Equinix, that were grabbing people coming out of university, it's for that innovation to say that, OK, you might have the next great idea. Come work with us. Let us help you incubate it and grow it. But there's no reason why other people can't do it. I'm, I, I talk to startups on a weekly basis. The CBCA will that. tell you that uh, uh, with cloud, they can uh, the same amount of money will yeah. fund 10 times as many startups as it funded. And, and what I was going to just to finish off my thought, it's no longer an infrastructure-driven world. It's now an application-driven mm -hmm. world. Take your mm -hmm. typical thought process and nice. flip it. Nice it comes down to the infrastructure is irrelevant now. It comes down to what your application is, you and you work it. down from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that up. yeah, just to add to that, I completely agree with Kevin. There's a war for talent, mm -hmm. right? And we've talked about the need for education and STEM focus and all of that. But I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of startups in the Toronto area and, and uh, a lot of entrepreneurs. And I know that a lot of young people want to work in startups, right? So I think the yep. dynamics have changed in mm -hmm. the last 10, 15, 20 years. A lot of young people actually either want to start up a company or want to work for a startup. So it, it's interesting. And, and then from a startup perspective or early stage company, all the technologies we've been talking about and referring to, mm -hmm. these are the great equalizer. Right? You can compete at a much more even level with the large companies. So I think it's a matter of adopting the technologies as well. Clearly, skills and resources are important. But the key is really how do you use these technologies to really have that global scale and, and take Absolutely. on the Absolutely. I mean, and the, the gig economy is uh, over 30%. Since we, have, since we have the government here, <laughs> let, let's, government. let's make a play. <laughs> You're representing the entire federal government. All level. Let's make sure. Say, this is really it. important. We, we are on a global, I'm going back to my buddy's Canada comment here. We are competing against other nations. Our mm -hmm. people are competing against other nations. Tax policy does play a role. And for mm -hmm. startups, there needs to be equity distributed and a <coughs> beneficial outcome from that equity, which is different to being an employee. Because right. there's a risk and there's a reward. Right. And thank goodness there was some discussion of, oh, we're going to change the options methodology. Oh my goodness. Guess how quickly the brightest entrepreneurs are going to move south of the border. Yes. Yeah. Okay, one more question, because it's 10.59 and we're, uh, we're at a... Uh, Sorry, Nanny, there's someone else with the mic. I okay. apologize for that. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm from Cybersecurity Project. And actually, my question is about a technology called quantum computing. Oh, yeah. So Ooh. we mentioned all those AI Qubits. <laughs> Love so Qubits. So what would that, uh, in your mind, like, uh, I don't know, for Microsoft, Google, or any companies, what's that impact to you? And what do you view the future of this kind of technology? At least for cybersecurity side, we're scared about it. Jim, he pointed to you. you <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we'll we'll have a uh, you know, kind of a different view on what quantum computing because quantum computing actually takes, you know, cloud computing is not necessarily geared directly for quantum computing either. And so there are some nuances there that we're working on uh, to create that type of offering. To cloud. Yeah, but we'll, so <laughs> so I think right now we 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 think that the opportunity ahead of us right now in, in just typical cloud and and uh, big data and machine learning and whatnot, that's kind of where our focus is right now. Anyone else on top uh, you know, I, if, if I may, I'm not an expert in quantum computing. I had Satya, our CEO in Toronto recently, and one of our really bright people asked him a question on quantum, quantum computing, and Satya went through a dialogue of <laughs> terms that I'd never heard in my life, uh, you know, much deeper than qubits. Uh, we, we, there was an announcement yesterday, such a just released, of uh, quantum computing in the Azure platform. And I know that we're making investments there. The, there are some potential breakthroughs. I think our, the work that's being done in Waterloo by the Institute is phenomenal. And the, you know, the investments from the founders of, of BlackBerry RIM are putting Canada on a global platform stage of really pulling in the best brains in the world into Canada. Don't know if you know that. I did a tour with the Information Technology Association of Canada uh, to, their, to their facility, and it is mind-boggling. So 
you know, we'll see where it goes. I would, I'm sort of, sort of on the alignment of it's a little bit more on the edge at this stage. Mm -hmm. I think if I was to direct my children, I'd direct them on Python and on Coco and, you know, taking advantage of blockchain and, and basic AI development first. But, you know, it, it'll, it'll well, happen. But well, Danny, it, it hits at the chip level, right? Yeah, it's, so uh, it's, from yeah. A, for an Intel point of view, so for sure we're watching and investing in, in that space like Ivily. So, but we believe it's still far from being like the technology that will like change everything. So, uh, because I mean, if you look from, from our point of view, so we're pumping like billions and billions in transistor every day, right? So that, and we can go through production level qubits. So that will a couple of years down the road, right? But that can be, it's for sure technology that can, can make a big leap and change everything. So because the way it's produced, which material will be done and stuff like that. So that can be a, gig, a big game changer for us. Because right now, if you look at it, for us to build a factory on the latest generation, we're talking about seven billion. So I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money, right? So but with qubits, that can change a lot. So which will completely change the landscape of our industry. So yeah. So when, and when Terry, I it's, it's my own personal rule: Terry. the consultant gets the last word. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this may be the only room that that's the rule. But uh, uh, all I would say on I should have mentioned quantum in the technologies that that Canada has an opportunity to take advantage of because I think with the quantum nano center and the perimeter institute, the combination of those two things in Waterloo are amazing. Plus, what's going on with D Wave out in Vancouver. Um, this is a big deal, guys. And if you guys are in the, in the technology, and especially in the data center space, you need to be tracking, tracking it. I would agree with the other panelists in terms of the timing. But so this falls into my bucket of scanning and sensing. You need to be watching it. You need to be seeing where the technology goes. If you want a fun little read on the uh, fictional side of the equation, Dan Brown's latest book on origin yeah. is actually kind of fun, and it gets mm -hmm. into quantum as one of the things that figures out the history of the universe and where we're going. It's like, um, it's like but, but actually, it's, it's, a, it's a non-fiction non book yeah. wrapped with a fiction veneer, but <laughs> <coughs> go through the book and enjoy all the, like, all the cities that he goes to and the art that he sees and check it out because there's some really cool stuff in that. But um, the reason this is such a big deal is because it can actually solve problems we haven't even thought about solving. And the risk is, if the promise of quantum computing comes true, all of the algorithms for security and crypto Gun. and encryption get blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. So in that world, this is a game changer if and when it mm -hmm. comes to fruition. So we have to be watching it. We have to be smart about it. And Canada actually has an opportunity to do something important and wave the flag. Thank you so much. Listen, this has been a huge pleasure for me and I'm sure for everybody else here. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Michael. Herd cats. Yeah, I'm proud. Oh my gosh. <laughs>